Okay, so no, that's me. Um, Ricardo Mendes, I introduced myself to some people earlier, but then for the others that just arrived, and we're going to be talking about closure, of course, as we have been for the past 10 minutes. So I'm an entrepreneur, I run my own business. We created an emergent actually where we have been doing a lot of stuff actually, mostly towards interactive and data analysis and data visualization side of things. I'm not going to be going into a lot of details, into a lot of like technical nitty gritty on closure, uh, but you can find some of the articles, some articles that are written on that URL. And if you want to reach out, that's my Twitter handle. So, what do I do? Uh, I'm basically a CTO for hire. I'm running large, complex projects for well, pretty large companies. Usually, I'm brought in to just put a team together. Some things the team remains after the project, some things the team is just going for the project, and I usually run this on a distributed manner, just working with, you know, I'm, I run it from here and the other developers in Britain, in Hamburg, in Berlin, depending on what the project is. And we're also working on our own projects. Uh, lately, all of these have been in Composure. Some of them are open source, and uh, you can see URLs to these on the site as well, that you can use sort of as a testbed for the things that we have been discussing. Previously, I was doing data analysis for banking, healthcare companies, financial institutions, and as I mentioned, game development, and all of the interactive things as well. So, how do we get to closure? Like, and by that, I mean also the company, not the, not the, not the software community at, last, at large. I first encountered this well over 20 years ago. I, actually was completely fascinated with it. I really liked the idea of the language. And uh, I think my first encounter was The Little Lisper by Felsen and Friedman, which I was unable to, I mean, that book is so old that I wasn't able to just find the cover for it online anymore, but there's the little schemer now. And it has a very playful approach to teaching this white languages. If you're looking for, a, for an introduction to this mentality, this is a, an actually a great place to start. And my first experiments went were on the genetic programming side, which uh, made list was like custom made courses. You can just modify to treat the, the the sources of data. You can just treat the sources of data structure and modify it. And I was fascinated with the language, but it really had very limited tooling and libraries. So whichever list you happen to choose, you were going to marry it and whatever you had. So you were limiting. You were very much limiting yourself if you wanted. To go with scheme, then you were lucky if you got enough tools. If you managed, if you wanted to go with common list, then you're gonna we're gonna go with a closer approach of things. It was everything was very insular, and uh, no, you know, had to make a living, so list wasn't really the best approach. Now, how did I get to closure? The first reason was because it was different from what I was doing. Quite frankly, I, I mentioned something on the I mentioned something on my description for the meetup that you know I was I'm doing this and that and trying to keep myself entertained and didn't try to just make cute to be cute you know I actually like to keep myself intellectually active and working on new things and the fact that closure was a different mentality than the object oriented approach that I was working on was definitely a huge appeal. Then there was the fact that we had access to the full Java platform. It, re it removed this ghetto-like approach that you had with either Scheme or Common Lisp or the other ones, where if you didn't have a library for something specific, you were screwed. You had to go out and build it yourself. On, on Java, you're going to have libraries for any, anything you want, like cryptography, authentication, whatever. You're going to find a good library for it. You know, while still being was still being a completely functional language, not a hybrid. You know, you can you can access objects from it, but Closure's approach is fully functional, which was a big growth for me. I wanted to challenge myself and do something different. And what I like about it is that new paradigms basically shape your thought process. You they grab your thing and they shake it up a bit and then they put it in the same place and you start seeing things with different perspective. Even if you happen to go back and work on the other stuff, now you're thinking about things differently. So um, it promised that I could, that you could learn not only a new language but a new way of thinking altogether. And that you know, I like that different perspective on this. There, there were other 
options on the Java platform, particularly Scala. But I, you know, I, I really couldn't get into it. it uh, I, I know there's some Scala files here, but it, to me, the weird mixture of object orientation with functional programming, with this just massive syntax that it has, it just it gave me the impression that the language just didn't know what it wanted to be. Uh, it was just throwing everything but the kitchen sink in. Closure had such a clean, straightforward syntax that it was, compared to Scala, it was a complete breath of fresh, breath of fresh air, you know. Even though Scala is trying to solve some of the same problems as Closure, which, you know, yay for it, it didn't click with me at the time. So, this is what we're going to talk about. First, it's not a language introduction. You know, there's some really great introductions online, there's some amazing tutorials that you can that you can go through. We're not going to be talking about the, the nitty-gritty of how you write stuff in Clojure. For a great introduction, actually, you should see this Wikihiki Clojure Made Sample. It's, um, and we're going to get you the slides, I expect, you know, with the URLs for later. It's really a good introduction to not just the language, but to the philosophy of the language and some of the problems that it's trying to solve, which we will touch into. What I'm going to be focusing on is how closures design decisions and the way that closures see the world, the world affects your work, which is, I consider, more important than just going into small code samples here and there. So we're not going to be overloaded with code samples. I think that's like the easy way out on a technical presentation. You just start paging through snippets that nobody can really understand and I'm not going to go that route. And I will give you access to some demo code that I've made. There is a full closure web application, a full reactive closure web application made completely in closure, both front end, front end secure closure script, the back end secure closure code that you can use as a guideline for how I'm doing things, which is just one way of doing them. And you can maybe play with it a bit. Now, everybody has a bias, and uh, you know, it's best to state them up front. As I mentioned, I have a bit of a bias against Scala syntax for starters. And this will be a bit of a personal talk, not from the life history point of view, but from my personal perspective on Clojure, why it works for me. Now, I do expect that some of the problems that Clojure solves for me are going to be problems that you have as well, so this is likely going to be useful. And on my biases, as I mentioned, you know, I've always found the it lists elegance appealing. So this really helped Clojure find touches on, on like mind share with me. Now, a bit of a spoiler alert, I'm gonna be unapologetically positive about it. I really like the language, I really like what it does, and I really like how, how productive it makes me. So with that in mind, I am actually going to start with the scales. That way, don't necessarily, we're going to try to not give you the impression that I'm sort of traveling Bible salesman of closure. So, <clears throat> let's get that bit going. And, you know, closure does have some scary bits. You know, you mentioned the parentheses. This is one of the things that people were like, oh, what the hell is this? And the first thing is that it's going to look weird. You know? Well, this is relatively, well, this is not relatively, this is rather straightforward code. You know, if you're used to closure, you can just see this and read it at a glance. It's going to be unfamiliar initially. You know, it's going to be, it's going to feel weird. And it's going to feel weird not because of its grammar. It's, its grammar and syntax are very straightforward. It's going to feel weird not because it's a different vocabulary. It's going to feel weird because closure has different semantics from what you're used to. Now, pop quiz time. What are semantics? Anyone? Anyone? Builder? No? The meaning of what's written? How you make meaning. Exactly. Uh, that, that, no, that, that's what they are. Semantics are how you make meaning. So, closure is going to be different because it doesn't just use different words. We're talking in terms of languages. It doesn't just use different words as, a, as you're used to, but because the meaning, the mechanism through which closure makes meaning is different than that of object-oriented languages. And you're not necessarily going to completely absorb this until you sit down and try to, try to write some relatively, some things that you would expect are relatively straightforward pieces. 
uh, that's the point at which it's going to really click, that you need to think in a different way in Clojure, which we'll get to. Now, the reason why Clojure tries to make meaning in a different way from, say, C Sharp and Java is because of the problems it's aiming to solve. And, um, you know, there's this line that I always like, and you might think that this is an appeal to unrelated authority, but I swear it's not. And, um, because we're not talking about programming here. We're talking about the approach that we take to deal with situations. Java, C Sharp might be different languages, might be at different times in their life cycle, but they take exactly the same approach to dealing with problems. Closure has a completely different approach to things. And the main reason why Clojure needs a different mentality is because it's aiming to solve problems that just trying to sprinkle on a bit of, uh, sprinkle on a little bit of syntactic sugar on top of Java really wouldn't help. In fact, some of the problems that Clojure are is solving are syntax. You know, the first problem is mutability, which we'll talk about. You know, being able, not being able to know where you have an object, where you have a piece of data, if something is going to change it from under you. The next one is inconsistency. And the final one is massive syntax. And we're going to talk about how Clojure solves this later. Not going to get into that, to, into that right now to avoid getting derailed into caution about the language. So let's continue with the steroids. The second one is likely to be documentation. You know, I can be quite enthusiastic about things. In fact, you know, I have this friend, Ral, who's a programmer from Cluj, and I've been sort of shoving closure down his throat for a few months now. And you know, he's interested, he's looking at it partly because he's working on a financial on a financial area, which it, it lines up very well with what they're doing. And he runs into this function, into. And the documentation has the signature into to from, into to x from from, which by itself is not exactly explicit, but then they top it off with this description. You know, returns a new call consisting of two call with all the items from, of from call conjoined, a transducer may be supplied. <laughs> That's the official documentation. So, Radu's reaction was this. <laughs> it wasn't literally this, this was the reaction image he sent along with it. His reaction was literal, this one. And I think we can consider him a bit later authority in the learning process. Now, the thing is, closure is not very badly documented, it's just very concise. So, that description that they gave tells you exactly what it does, but doesn't try to help you at all. So, it doesn't tell you that you can ignore what transducers are for now, because you, know, you might be using them and not know. It doesn't tell you that there's a conch verb, for instance. It doesn't tell you anything else that might help a newbie getting acquainted with language. So, basically what that bit would say, if it was written by a human being, would be it's going to take one collection and move it into a different collection by conjoining items to it. That's it. Now, the question here is why does it say conjoin? And it's not doing this just to win purple prose points or to try to sound like it's using big Sunday words, but because conjoining has a very specific meaning in closure. There's actually a conch verb that you can use. Now, you will notice that I've said verb twice. We're going to get into the whys of this later. The reason why this isn't a big deal, regardless of how obtusely the main documentation might be written, is because on the same page that you can find that horrid Martian-like description, you're going to find a whole bunch of community examples. And you're going to find people who tell you exactly what conch does in different situations, because, and uh, what conch, I'm sorry, what into those, because conch behaves differently if you're talking to a map than if you're talking to a, than if you're talking to a list or a vector. So um, pretty much every item in the closure documentation is full of community examples. You're much better off relying on this than you're relying on the very succinct description. And you know, worst case scenario, you can always take the function and try on the closure repo. 
see what it does, see how it behaves, which is one of the huge advantages of the language that we'll get to as well. By the way, I can get carried away and totally pretty, so if anybody has any questions midway through, just interrupt me, that way we don't forget and save them to the end. Now, them's the scary bits, that's it. There's nothing really beyond the unfamiliarity and the somewhat of two documentation that you're really going to have to get worried about when talking to Clojure. So, let's talk about the problems that Clojure solves. As I mentioned, the big ones were mutability first, inconsistency, and massive syntax. And as I mentioned, yes, it's going to look weird, but that's because it's trying to approach these things. Now, show of hands, actually, first, since I sort of got an idea of how many of you know Clojure, but I'm not really sure how many of you are actually working on functional programming language right now. You do three, two, okay, so about four out of how many we have? Twelve? Okay, so 30%. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to go into that a bit. And um, the thing with immutability and functional programming that you have to keep in mind is that functions are not just methods by a different name. Yeah. A function takes a value or a set of values and it returns a value. That's it. Now, this might sound like a method, but a function, a pure function, does not change anything in the middle when you call it. That function can only return a value. Whatever it does inside, you don't care, but you know that it's not modifying any of the information that you pass to it. Now, if you have been using LangQ in, in C Sharp, it sort of gets you there. It's, it's a start, actually. I believe Java is finally catching up after LangQ has been on .NET for what, like eight years? I don't know. But neither of these enforces mutability. F Sharp does, but that is something that the language itself has to do. You can't just tack that on top of C Sharp. Yeah. So, at the, end of it, at the end of it, you're still juggling objects. Some will have methods. Some will have properties that actually have side effects inside them, which is not necessarily a good practice. But you know that it can happen. You know that there, there's going to be, that your object is going to expose some setters because you have to set your object's value somehow. And those setters are likely accessible to whomever is going to end up calling this. You know that inside of your code, there's going to be some calculated interest or process transaction or something method that, sure, it returns a value, which is likely just the result code of, yes, I succeeded or no, I failed, but it might be changing a whole bunch of stuff inside. And, you know, this is the sort of thing that you have to keep in mind. And that's fine when you have a couple of classes, when you have a small set of code that you're dealing with, but you need to keep the side effects in mind as you code. You need to know that this method, this process transaction method, goes in and sets maybe the completed status for all of this. You know that if this thing, if this method failed, for instance, and this method happened to be midway through modifying your objects, then you're going to need to see how to roll them back if it was actually modifying them. Like there's all these considerations that you need to have in mind. And the thing is, we're Polyble creatures, you know, we have, we really have thin, we have thin mind space. And maybe you know that process transactions is modifying this couple of things in there. But since we have this, this finite mind space, the fact that you need to keep this in mind means that you might forget it. It means that you might be tripping because of a bug because that some, somebody else created. Maybe somebody modified the method and they didn't tell you. They modify the test suite, but your particular case wasn't considered, and you realize after six hours of debugging. I mean, this sort of thing, the relationships between classes and who can see who and who can touch who has gotten so bad because of the complexity of the programs that we're dealing with, that we have to come up with, with stuff like this. And this isn't even a class diagram. This is a package diagram. A class diagram of this thing, we wouldn't, this is Spring and Hibernate. A class, of di a class diagram of these things, we wouldn't even be able to fit on the screen, much less keep it in mind the whole time. And 
you know, the same feeling that the same thing in your brain that makes you think that, ooh, closure looks weird when you see it just because it doesn't look familiar should make you terrified of having to keep all the relationships of your classes and who touches on who in mind the whole time. You know, this is a class diagram, and I'm not sure how well you can read it, so I'm not sure how if you know what this thing is. You can see all these relationships going here and there, this guy references that, this guy inherits from the other one. You know what this is? This is a recipe manager. I'm pretty sure that you know, I have no idea what you guys are working on, but I'm pretty sure that whatever it is, it's going to be more complex than something that's used to store the ingredients for Mamalika. <laughs> so imagine trying to do this with Hibernate and Spring. So even assuming that you have all the mind space for the possible side effects of the code base that you're working on, even though you know that this process transaction function is changing a value, inside, and you can't really change its behavior because there's all this other code that relies on it. Even assuming you can keep everything like that loaded in your brain and it doesn't affect your performance, why would you want to? What would you, why would you want to be using brain cycles holding this thing, which these things are purely scaffolding? You know, why would we want to have to think of the scaffolding when what we, sh what we should be focusing on is the building? The more we're thinking about this stuff, that this has nothing to do with the work that we're actually doing, the less that we're thinking about the actual work. Having done the preaching part on that end, there's something else that immutability also helps with, which is parallelism. I'm not going to go too deeply into this, mostly because we could be talking about parallelism and asynchronous communications for hours. But immutability makes parallelism much, much simpler. You know that if you're passing this to a function that's going to be running at the same time as other things, these multiple things are not going to be tripping each other. You know that they cannot mo be happening to modify at the same things at the same time, mostly because nothing can modify things. So you're not going to have to deal with locks. And this by itself removes a huge headache. Even further than that, you don't really care where it runs since nobody, since nobody will modify the state. If you have immutable data, you can have it run on a different core. You could have it run on a different machine. You just don't care because you know that you don't need to, modify, to care about if that thing expected to modify your state or if you were expecting the thing that you passed to it to be in a different state after. There is no state other than the current one, period. I've, frankly, I've had to do parallelism by hand in the past, and I'm never doing that again. It's a huge management nightmare. I'd rather just not have to think about if I'm locking things at the right time, if I'm getting deadlocks, all that possible tangled mess. I'd rather focus on the meaning of the program that I'm trying to write. And with closure and mutable data, you just get purely transparent parallelism, as you get in other functional and in other purely functional languages. Now, then there's the problem of massive, massive syntax that we were talking about. And I actually consider this to be a bigger problem than unfamiliar, sem than unfamiliar semantics. As I was saying, yes, the semant closure semantics are different from what you're used to. But the huge advantage of semantics is that you need to learn them once if they're cons consistent. Whereas syntax is an ongoing cost. It's going to keep tripping you. You're going to have to keep wondering, okay, how did I write this in this particular language, particularly if you're using, I don't know, Scala on the back end, but happen to be using JavaScript or CoffeeScript or what have you on the front end. Now you're having to juggle two syntaxes at the same time. And again, syntax has the disadvantage that it also uses a headspace. Now, would you rather use this headspace for the syntax that you need to keep there or for the concepts of the domain that you're trying to address? This is, as I mentioned, one reason why just sprinkling in some syntactic sure on top of Java wouldn't have solved the problems that Claude was solving. You end up with something like, again, this, this Scala situation. Now, this is a key thing when thinking about syntax, which is that code is read more than it is written. 
Think about that for a moment. It means that even if you write the code once and then refactor to it and then leave it for a while, lots of people are going to have to read it. Maybe even you are going to have to go over it over and over and over because you don't know if the bug is on this bit or on that bit. So given that code is read more than it is written, we need to convey meaning quickly without unnecessary ceremony. You, know, you don't want, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a new programmer or if it's just you six months from now and you have no idea how, why you wrote this thing or if this thing is doing what you expect to do. You know, you don't want whomever is reading this to start with a virtual private list of your, by the time that they get to your actual code, they're just tired of looking at all the freaking structure because they stop paying attention and have a hard time shaping themselves back to just focusing on the meaning of what's in there. Now, and that's actually before we discuss the Baroque classes architectures that people end up throwing on top of this whole stuff with their masses of getters and which thing receives an int and which thing receives what. Actually, there's a great example of this also on Closure Made Simple on the same talk from before where Hickey compares the approach of the, I think it is the Spring HTTP request object with the Closure version that I definitely recommend you really spend the hour that it takes to watch the talk. Finally, a big one is inconsistency. And this is something that you sort of need to experience. There's no other way around that. I can talk about it but until you have actually sat down and, and seen it for yourself, is that you actually get it. This means that you're li never likely to get into a situation where you have a method somewhere that you think would be a great fit for, for the class that you're writing, but you can't pass that class to that object just because your class doesn't implement the right interface or because that thing would modify it or, or whatever it is. The way that Clojure thinks is in terms of collections and it encourages, to use, it encourages you to use maps, hash maps specifically. And you can also create records, which if you need to define you know, a particular type structure that you want to have very defined properties, but even this record is it will be immutable, and even this record behaves like a map. So you can act it, you can act on it through the same facilities that you would be using for everything else. So what you ran getting to, sorry, is basically a situation where the same functions act over everything. If into takes a collection, that means you can pass it any collection whatsoever. If this thing takes a map like object, you're gonna be able to pass anything that behave, behaves like a map-like object. It makes things absolutely consistent and it makes it so easy when you're trying to do anything else, knowing that you already have the into verb, and now that you finally understood what it does, you can use the into verb for anything that is exactly like that. The number of verbs that you have to keep jogging around immediately shrinks. So, let's talk a bit about the learning process for closure, even going beyond the documentation that, that uh, we were mentioning. The thing with a language, with any language, any natural languages, is that you have to know their scheme. You have to sort of know what they're leaning towards, what they're heading on. So, for instance, if we're talking about natural languages, we have English. English has a trivial grammar, but pronunciation is a mess. Like, there's no other way to learn how to speak English but to completely memorize the pronunciation because there are no rules, period. It's basically based on whomever had control of England at the time that they came up with the word. Now, Spanish, on the other hand, for instance, is not as heavy on the pronunciation side. On the pronunciation side, Spanish is very simple. You just learn the rules and things are pronounced exactly as they are written. And if you encounter an unfamiliar word later, you know exactly how to pronounce it because the rules are there and they're very simple. You're never gonna run into a situation like tor and poor in English, which are written exactly the same way except for the first letter, but pronounced completely different for no good reason. And then you have something like Romanian, which has an interesting pronunciation with lots of phonemes that even Latin speakers want to hear, and a grammar that it's e. So you need to know what's the heavy thing when dealing with a language. 
closure the grammar is the simplest, cleanest thing that you're going to find. Period. In closure, the weight is on the verbs, which is why I was saying that there's a conch verb before. In closure, all the functions are verbs, they're actions. This is going to act upon that. So basically, the verb goes first, right after the first parenthesis, and then it's followed by anything that the verb acts upon. You know that anything following the verb is a piece of data. And if in the middle of all those pieces of data you see another parenthesis, that means that that thing is going to be followed by a verb as well, and that verb is going to return a piece of data. But by the time you have to act on it, it will be a piece of data. So if you get a situation like this, and this is going to be one of the very few code examples that I'm going to show, you always know that the first thing after a parenthesis is a verb. It is completely consistent. So we get a plus. The plus is a verb that's going to sum all the other stuff. Map. Map is a verb that is going to act upon the other things. Of create token, that's a verb. It acts over the other two things, and as we can see, the other two things are verbs as well that they act upon. So the, same, the grammar is absolutely simple. Now, as I mentioned, since this Q is on the verb, but the semantics are different, you're going to need to pay attention to them. You're not going to be able to learn closure sitting down and learning a function now and then. That would be like me trying to learn Romanian by learning how to use a milk and how to use a taxi or something. You know, you, you're going to be learning the isolated words, but you're not going to learn how to make meaning in the language. So you have to get acquainted with closure. You have to use it regularly to really understand the semantics, to really absorb them. You can't just get a closure book and read cover to cover and think, yeah, I absolutely understood this whole thing. Because it's not just about understanding how closure expresses things, it's about learning yourself how to express yourself differently in the language. So it's not about understanding it, it's about grokking the semantics. And who has heard the word grok before, by the way? Because I just realized that I sort of did it. One, two, three, perfect. So, grok comes from a word in book, Stranger in a Strange Land. It means to understand things so thoroughly that the observer becomes that the observer becomes part of the observer. And what this means is that you understand something so much that it becomes a part of you. So, it is closure is basically about doing. This is going to be the learning process. You need to sit down and write closure in order to properly learn it. Um, a good analogy is the katas that people do when they when they are when they're learning martial arts. You know, they you don't think, oh, I'm gonna move my hand this way. You just repeat the movement multiple times until it becomes something almost autonomic. A great analogy that I read once is this thing that uh, it wasn't about closure, but I think it was about losing weight. And it said that you can't just subscribe to a running magazine. You have to get out there and run. You can't just get a closure book and read it or read up on functional programming. You have to start writing functional programming code. Now, I would not recommend you try it first with a even small size application, but there's something called foreclosure.com, which really helps with getting on the hands-on process. What it does is that it presents a series of problems, as in, for instance, add all these numbers. You know, it starts very simple. And then it tells you, if you have this hash map, obtain all the values. And it has a series of tests that the little bit of code, the little function that you write needs to pass. And it's going to tell you, yeah, you, you pass these three tests, but you fail this fourth one. So that means that the function is not behaving the way that it should. And this having to write this little sneak of closure really helps drill in the, the functional mentality. And the thing is, after you have run through the four, to at least some of the foreclosure examples, is that you need to find something that you want to say, much like with any language. There's something that you want to say, it might be a library, it might be a small application, but you need to find something that you want to write and start writing it. And I'm going to give you, it's going to be an interesting learning curve. Your, 
your initial examples of closure are, are going to be like this. You know, you I'm not sure if you have anybody who who comes if you have anyone who comes from a Latin language, like you know, Romanian, Spanish, French, or what have you. And when they start speaking English, they speak in it, they speak it in this very haphazard, awkward, clunky manner. Like they say, I am to going to fetch the value. You know, it sounds weird, and they're adding all these unnecessary prepositions and adverbs that they don't really need into the into the sentence. And these are smart people. You know, these are people who manage even to get English pronunciation, that as I mentioned, is the complex part of English. But they seem to continue tripping over the grammar. And the reason why you're getting to this, why these people get into the situations, I found, is not because of the grammar, not because of the grammar is difficult for them, but quite the opposite. It is because the grammar is way simpler than the grammar that they're used to. So they're sort of trying to impose the, the much more complex syntax of their own language into the much simpler grammar of English. So you have to get used to that idea. The first code that you write in Clojure is not going to feel idiomatic. Unlike if you were going from Python to Java, chances are your code is going to feel idiomatic pretty quickly. The first code that you write in Clojure is not going to look like that. But you have to get used to that idea that the really tricky thing about Clojure's grammar is that it's actually much simpler than you expect. You're going to start thinking, well, where do I put the return type? Well, you don't. You're in a dynamic language. You need to specify the return type. And you're going to say, well, where do I return? Like, how do I, what's the keyword that I use to return a value? You don't use one. Any function in closure is just going to return the last value that the function finds. That's it. This is what you're going to have probably the hardest time of just scrubbing your mind off of the off of all the other extra syntax that you're used to. And quite frankly, after I did this, after, after I went through this process, having to go back and help someone do a Zoom code review of a .NET web application was horrible. It, it, it was a straightforward .NET application. It, was a, it wasn't even like the old ASP.NET, it was ASP.NET MVC, and the whole thing felt like a contract written by a lawyer. It was hideous. So, actually, since I started working in Clojure, I found that most of my time goes into figuring what I want to say. Basically, figuring out what this function is supposed to do, not how to express it. As, as opposed to when I was working on C Sharp or Java, for instance, I didn't get, I didn't, I couldn't get to that right away. First, I had to, I wrote my object, and then I decided, well, I'm going to need these properties for the object, and I wrote a stub for the method, for instance. I was writing all the scaffolding that I just don't need enclosure anymore. Since that thing disappears entirely, I can completely focus on precisely what the function is supposed to be doing. You know, there's no boiler. It's basically just you and whatever you want to calculate. So it also feels at first like you're not going anywhere, like you're really unproductive because you're not banging fingers on keys. But what you should bear in mind is that this whole banging fingers on keys to get the whole boilerplate structure out wasn't actually productive. It was just busy work before. Now you're spending the time actually thinking about what you need to think. Now, even though I did mention that you just shouldn't just focus on book learning per se, I'm going to recommend two very good books on closure for, for if you're starting. The first one is this, uh, Daniel Higginbottom's Closure for the Brave and True, for which apparently I forgot the URL. This is a great starting book, and if you do a search for that, it's also available for free on the web. So the version on the web is slightly outdated, but it's going to be updated sometime this week to match the print version, which just came out. And this is a great, really light, well introduction. Like it's actually very playfully written introduction to the language. Now you should probably start with this if you want to learn closure while working on the foreclosure programs. Remember, don't just go for this thing. And the second one is Dmitry Sotnikov's Web Development with Closure. Uh, this one is not available for free, but you can get it for from Pragmatic Programmers. This is a really good look 
at one way of building closure applications. Might be a wee bit outdated because I think it came out a couple of years ago and some of the libraries have been moving relatively quickly, but it's really a good way at how to put something together in closure. What was the name of the framework used? Ah, that's something we're going to get to actually. Which the answer is none. Now, before we get before you get to this book, just try to do some 30, 40 programs of um, of foreclosure. Otherwise, you're just going to be repeating incantations from the book that you don't really fully grok what they're doing. So, since you're so quite famous, so let's talk about the closure way. Because closure has a particular approach to things as, as a community overall. And the first one is that it focuses on small, easily replaceable libraries. It's sort of similar to the approach of Unix online tools when you want them to do one thing only and just do that thing very well and make it really easy for something else to take the output of that thing and do something else with it. This means that if you're, if you're finding a library for routing, that library is going to do routing, period. It's not going to do authentication, it's not going to do authorization. It's not going to try to be a B.O. and O. shop of web stuff, it's just going to do routing. The function that uh, helps you access the database, it's, the library is just going to do that, period. And the second thing is templates over frameworks. Uh, which is what you were asking. What you were asking about. There's Luminous, which is uh, it was like a section maintained by Dmitry Sotnikov, the, the author of web development application closure, and he calls it a micro framework. But what it actually is is a set of templates, and a template is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a very basic project. It has some some libraries already pre-referenced in it. It has some glue code, like maybe it uh, connects the routing library with the with whatever you're using for the for handling the REST services. But the key thing with these templates is that unlike the framework, they're not all or nothing. You know, you could take any of these libraries and rip out take any of the templates and rip out have the libraries, replace it with equivalent libraries, and be just as happy. And the final thing that you have to keep in mind about the closure way is that there's no automatic stuff going on. And this one merits going a bit in, in depth about it. You know, since um, we're talking about Libraries, there's no really, uh, with frameworks, there's no really something like Grails, for instance, in the closure world. There's something called closure on coils, but I'm actually not entirely sure if that's a framework or a joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, the description reads like it's some sort of practical humor, I have no idea. Or somebody that just didn't get it. So, since we just mentioned Grails, let's talk a bit about no, the no automatic thing. There's no method injection, for instance, because well, for starters, we don't have objects to inject methods into. So you're not going to get something <laughs> like, for instance, when who has who here has used Grails? Hibernate? Anyone? Okay. So you're not going to get something like what you get with uh, Grails and Groovy on Hiber with Hibernate. That if you just create a stock class on a particular on a particular folder, when that class gets compiled, then then Grails takes it and adds a whole bunch of method accessors to it and adds a whole bunch of uh, hibernate stuff that you can use. You're not going to get this with closure. Now, this might sound like a bad thing if you just want to get a CRUD thing going quickly. And frankly, I used to love the Grails approach until I realized that I couldn't control it. It is going to add all this stuff whether you like it or not. If you're using a, if you're using a domain class in Grails, it's going to get all these things. You can tell it, well, do this, do this, but don't do the other thing. Nope. And the advantage of, on, on closure is that you're going to get absolutely full control over what's going on. You're never going to have to wonder, if I upgraded Grails, did that 
are those functions still automatically injected? Are those methods still automatically injected? Or do I now need to code the things by hand myself? This is something that's not going to happen as well. That's not going to happen at all. And this has the advantage that since you have full control over what's going on, it means that the libraries are trivial to replace. You know, first of all, you don't have to wonder about what goes on behind the scenes because of the functional approach. You don't know, you need to know if I call this function something else, if I call this method something else is going to get out there. You just know how it's supposed to be. And you're never going to get into a situation, for instance, like what happened to us with uh, Grails and Gorm. Gorm is the persistence framework of Grails that when we tried to remove Gorm because we weren't going to use a relational database with, and Gorm is very useful. With, like, we did like most of the Grails things, but we didn't want to use a relational database for a particular project. And we couldn't remove it because back then Gorm was extremely tightly tied into Grails. It took a major refactoring of the good chunk of the community working on it so that corn became something optional. That's something that is never going to happen to you with closure. You know that if you're using this library, this library is replaceable, period. You may not want to see to go in and change it. You may not want to have to deal with the glue that holds it together, but the glue is there for you to change if you want. Which gets us to this, which is where I'm going to talk about how I actually structure uh, closure web applications, which is pretty much closure everywhere. So, the first thing that you were asking me earlier was the use of refactoring. And it's actually something that I found significantly easier. You know, revisiting closure code is significantly easier than I expected. And I did not see this one coming, I probably should have, but it's partly because of immutability. Since I have, if I have a bunch of code, I know that whatever is between this block of parentheses is a completely self-contained unit. There's not, this thing is, if I take this thing out of here and put it elsewhere, I know that there's nothing that got executed after that was expecting some side effect that this thing caused. If I find that I have a function, if I have a block of code inside a function that I need elsewhere, taking out is trivial because we're, we're manipulating closure code, which is nothing more than a tree structure. So we just take one particular sub-branch of the tree structure, move it elsewhere, and replace it with a code. It's, after you have done this a few times, it's just amazing how different that is from trying to go into a method and figure out, okay, this 10 lines here, the, um, this 10 lines are sort of what I did, uh, sort of what I want to do, but this line number six actually should remain out of this block. It just happened to be put there because of however we were writing it. And when you try to refactor functionality out of a method, you usually need to try and look a lot more about the context that your code is in. In Clojure, we don't really need to worry about the context because there's no context, period. The context is this thing got called and returned a value. The end. So, why this is important is because I mentioned earlier that the code is read more than it is written, which is true. But as Ernst Hemingway said, writing is rewriting. Okay? Chances are we're gonna get we're not going to get things perfect the first time. And even if we do get things perfect, chances are that that very big function that we created, we're gonna want to refactor it into smaller ones so that we can reuse it. And closure's immutability makes this well and, and its tree structure and the code makes this absolutely trivial. I've really found that I've had a much easier time refactoring an application in Clojure, when, even when I haven't seen it for months, than I do in C Sharp when I'm still actively working on it. Then there's the repo, which is Clojure while exploring. And this is not the best screenshot ever. And unfortunately, we can't plug in my machine to this monitor, but we can do a bit of a demo if we work together after which is that as you're developing Clojure code, you can just load up a Clojure environment in which you reference your code and you start calling it. 
And as long as that, as that code compiles, you're going to be able to execute it. And since, again, there's no context to any of these functions, you, know, you don't need to have gone through the spring initialization process or anything like that. You don't need to have to call the things that injected whatever methods you were going to need. If you can reference a function, you can call it, and you can test it completely live the whole time. And it's really interesting how this has affected my workflow. Because what I found is that this trivial use of function that I get as I develop is not only excellent for testing my own code, but for exploring somebody else's code. Because there's no context. If I see the into function, the into function, and I have no idea what it does, I call it. And I immediately see how it behaves. And it actually led to a, an unintentional workflow, let's say, where I write a function, then I start experimenting with it on the repo just to make sure that it's doing everything that I had in mind for it, that none of the edge cases that I come up with fail. And then I take the exact same code that I was writing on the repo and codify its tests. You know, like completely straightforward, straightforward from that. Because the tests also need no scaffolding because what you're doing on the repo. And this has actually resulted on me having a much higher test coverage than I otherwise would because I get a two for one. At the same time that I'm experimenting with my code, I'm writing the tests. Then we have, as you can imagine, this whole thing is happening on the back end. But we also have closure script, which is closure on the browser. It is the exact same closure code as you would write for the Java for the Java platform, I've only found one particular difference, which is is rather obscure. And what it does is that it gets transpiled to JavaScript. Now, what this means, however, the only thing to keep in mind here is that now you're running on JavaScript as a platform. You don't get access to the Java platform. So, if your pure closure code is going to be working just fine, but if you depended on something that was very much that was very much Java specific, then you're going to have to write a small function that realizes if you're if you're in Java or JavaScript and calls the correct one. It actually just gets compiled differently at compile time. And you get all of Clojure's advantages on the browser. You get the ease of refactoring, you get the immutability, you get the easy, the easy parallelism, you get to use any pure closure libraries, for instance, the all closure closure .sync, which is a core .sync, which is a great library for asynchronous communication, and you end up with something that's not only straightforward and consistent on the front. And as we were talking earlier, JavaScript refactoring is tedious, but you end up with both front and back end on the same language, and often you can reuse the functions that you wrote. Validation functions and other things from the back end on the front end as well. And more importantly, it enables some amazing tools that I can demo after and we can talk about. But um, and this is mostly because since closure is a list like it's code as data. And being able to just reload and alter and modify the code at runtime in a very trivial manner has resulted on a very interesting ecosystem of, of browser, of web development oriented tools. One of them that I really liked is Reagent, actually, which is how I use, how I do components on the closure side of things. And it's a React wrapper. You can find it at this address. It has some amazing, straightforward, clean, really clean examples. There's another, well, there's several other React wrappers uh, written in Clojure, including OM. But I tried OM once, and it was it had so much ceremony that it almost felt like it was reading Java code. So tried Reagent, loved it, tossed OM aside. Well, which was this one with a lot of boilerplate? Sorry? Uh, you mentioned another one? OM. 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 OM, yes. Now, it's getting better, from what I understand. I first tried OM a bit over a year ago, and I understand it's getting better. In fact, there was a really great article dissecting one of the most complicated things about ARM, which was when you were when data was being modified live on the for display on the for the component, uh, you had to keep to keep track of data courses yourself, which got really cumbersome. 
And I understand that's no longer an issue, but as I said, I really haven't used OM since I found Reagent. And the examples that you're gonna find on that URL are just absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's, it, it uses closures facilities of keywords, uh, the things with the columns in front of them, and of keywords and lists, so that you define your components as a data structure, or actually you define your components as a function that returns a data structure. And then it uses a small parsing library called Hiccup to turn this data structure into HTML. Then there is Reframe, which is reactive closure, closure script on the browser. And it's a reactive pattern implementation using reagent and well, I can use I can use you some I can show you some examples on this uh, tropology code that I that I had to show. You can find that this um, on this uh, site the README for the library itself has a great description of the of the reframe pattern. And the key thing about reframe is not only that it's it's not only that it's reactive, but uh, that there's combined with reagent, you end up with a tiny surface area affected whenever you find a change. And this is something that you can see on this project that I'm, that I'm going to give you the URL for. If you go in and check the commits, you're going to find that basically whenever I do a change, I like touch a couple places. There's this little bit of this place in the component that nothing else needs to know about because why would they? You know, there's no context. Or there's this little change on the event handler that turns to result that nothing else needs to worry about because, again, that's not modifying any data, it's just returning values. And this combination of reagent and reframe, I absolutely love with ProjectScript. In fact, you know, I've, I'm more of a back end guy. I've always hated and avoided front end code. Like, freaking dislike JavaScript with, with a vengeance. Like, you have no idea how mad JavaScript makes me. All the little idiosyncrasies, it's, it's a mess. And, and if you've mostly worked in JavaScript and you're sort of used to it, you know, batter wife syndrome, like maybe you don't see it. But trying to come from a, from a more, let's say, reasonably behaving language to JavaScript is a bit of a nightmare. Whereas closure script with closure script reagent and reframe, it's the first time in I don't know twenty something years that I found myself happy, like actually enjoying doing front end work. Like this is the sort of stuff that I always hired people for. And now I just sit down and quickly code a UI for whatever I'm building. It's just absolutely pleasurable. Then there's Speedwheel, which is one of these tools that I mentioned that have been enabled by closure script being a Lisp. And it was created by Bruce Haugman. You can find it at this URL, and you've probably seen somebody do a brief demo on Figwell. I mean, somebody did a brief demo on the, what was it, iTake that we were in. And what it does is that it scans closure script source folders as your application is open on the browser. And if it, if it detects a change, it recompiles the application, and if the compile succeeds, then it reloads the application life. And the usual example that people give for this is like, look, there's my hello world label, and I'm gonna go into the code and change it to hello everyone, and then the label changes. And the reaction for people is, well, big whoop, you know, this thing is what, pressing a 5 for you or something? It's, that, that's a completely useless example. But much like all the other things that have been mentioning with closure, once you actually start working on something, and you really see the effects of this, it's, it's a complete game changer because it's not just that it presses a pipe for you, it's not that it refreshes the page, it's not refreshing the page at all, it's just changing the code. So it reloads the code live, it changes the entire code base on the browser, there's absolutely no data loss whatsoever. Now I, could, I can show you an application where we have a whole bunch of data displayed and we can go in and change the behavior of uh, somebody clicking on a button, and this gets recompiled, reloaded, no data loss, no, nothing display changes, nothing is modified except that particular bit. When you have that speed of iteration, it's, it's amazing the things that you can build. But again, you're going to need a sufficiently complex program up to a point in order to actually see these advantages.
So, been at this for almost an hour, so let's uh, do some final quick suggestions. First off, is that you need to start off small. You know, again, if you're going from C sharp to Java, you're not really learning a new language for intents and purposes. What you're learning is new vocabulary. You know, the word for save is this one in C sharp, but on this one, it's uh, I need to use a string buffer or what have you. You're not really learning a new mentality at all, which you are in closure. So there will be a learning curve. You need to start up small, and the foreclosure examples are the foreclosure exercises are a perfect way to achieve this. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are templates for closure, and there's a big temptation of saying, well, I know web development, I only need to learn the language and how how the framework, how this framework does this. So I'm just going to start off a template, and then I change this thing and that. Don't get used to hacking off templates way too blindly. That's a good way of very quickly falling, off, falling into like cargo, cargo code programming, where you think that this is sort of doing something, but it's not really because you're not really acquainted with the functions. And I've seen it really often. You know, people start work, start hacking off of a template, and very quickly it gets out of hand, so they think that, you know, oh, I have no idea, this thing's a mess, this thing's very confusing, and that's because they, they were starting to try, they tried, they were trying to say too much at first, you know, if I, if I start learning Romanian, and I start trying to learn Romanian by translating a Quixote, you're going to think I'm insane, you're going to think, well, why don't you try a couple of phrases at the supermarket first? And after you're used to a couple of phrases in the supermarket, well, why don't you try reading a children's book? And eventually, if you want to get to a hotel, well, do that. But um, don't try to get too cocky initially. And finally, this is a very good URL to visit. If you're not that familiar with closure, a lot of the things here are not going to make sense right away. But once you sort of get going, this is going to help you spot some typical things that people trip over initially, precisely because of the lack of familiarity with the semantics. So right, that's uh, pretty much what I had before we jump into code. So, any questions? Hi, so uh, you were very biased. You actually yes. like uh, like closure. I was actually wondering uh, what are the bad parts? When would you actually use an uh, object-oriented programming? Because the, the accent on the, in the industry is still on more or less uh, on the object-oriented side of things. Is this a legacy? Is a matter of taste? What are your opinions? Because Lisp's Lisp, Lisp language, languages have been for more than 20 years uh, yes. as Java. So, well, several questions, and uh, you know, why is this still the case? I could. One of the things is because universities keep teaching, so there's a lot of more people who are familiar with the object-oriented semantics than they are with the functional ones. That's one. Now, where would I not use closure? There's two main areas. Well, the first one is if a client forces me to. I'm like, okay, I can. You know, you're paying me a lot of money to do it this other way. Fine, you know, it's your ticket. You want to? This thing would take me half the time to build in closure, and you want me to pay? You want to pay twice as much just because you want it in C sharp? Okay. Your bill. That's thing one. Thing two, and this is a bit of an edge case, is that you need to keep in mind that for all the advantages of immutability, it does have a cost, which is that it is garbage collection. Your and closure addresses this with persistent data structures, which we really can't go into right now, but it, it addresses to try and minimize garbage collection. But the fact is that you're going to be using up more disposable bits of data if you don't modify them than if you have something that you just have one bit of data and you keep iterating over it. One particular situation, and I actually did a bit of a test on this that you can find the numbers on the side, on the closure script side of things, is, as I mentioned, I come from the, I've been doing a lot of interactive develop, development in the past few years. So if you have something that's real time, and by that I mean something that you're executing repeatedly, let's say 30 times per second, this is going to generate a massive amount of garbage collection. 
and it's going to be sore because you're going to keep being hit with garbage collection pain. Now, this is a very particular edge case. This is something that gets, again, you're, you're throwing away a lot of data 30 times per second. And on the particular example that I that I benchmarked, I think, off the top of my head, but I think I was dealing with about 40, uh, 50 autonomous agents, which were updating multiple properties 30 times per second. So we're, we're basically throwing out about throwing away about uh, 12,000 data items per second. At that point, garbage collection is going to be ahead. Now, if what you're building is not a game or something that needs to be completely real-time, and more importantly, if you care more about consistency than immediate apparent performance, so you can throw hardware that problem, like you know, you're running a server. It's cheaper to buy a server that's twice as fast than to hire a whole bunch of programmers to debug something for weeks. So if you're not tied to this very particular constraint, I really wouldn't worry about the garbage collection issue that much. Yes? Oh, I, uh, what I see is that, is that uh, this uh, closure tries to solve problems pretty much the same way as Haskell. How would you compare Haskell with closure? I am not the right person to answer that. I have I have a passing familiarity with Haskell, but not enough to dig in. So, sorry. <laughs> now, if if you can compare this with uh, with Haskell, on you know if, if this is something if this is a comparison that you can make yourself, it's definitely a, it's purely a list. Like, well, yes, it is. It provides mechanisms for accessing objects which you wouldn't get on this, but other than that, it's a list. Anything else? Oh, yes. Have you ever used the closure over Android? No, I haven't used closure on mobile, and that's actually that will fall on the same issue on the, as real time, where you're running an environment with relatively limited resources and where you don't really control the environment. So, you, know, you have all this well massive range of Android phones. I'm really curious about it. I actually want to do something with React Native, which now you can do with Clojure Script, but haven't gotten to that yet. Um, so in terms of complexity and setup and boilerplate and all that, do you feel like Clojure moves all of that to the data structure up, um, instead of the code itself? Right, the data structure that you're modifying and passing through and transforming using all of your functions, does, is that taking the bulk of the complexity? No, not really, because there's, if you mean boilerplate, there's no really Data structure boilerplate. Well, in terms of like, I have to structure this so that I can get from A to B, and I'm trying to get from like something that's, I don't know, um, a CSV format of something to an HTML document, right? So I need to figure out how I'm going to break this apart so that I have all of the keys that I need so that I can do all the all of the transforms and end up with something that's HTML. Does that make sense? I, I know what you're saying, but I don't see how it's a different problem from what you would get. Oh, no, I'm not saying that's a different problem. I'm saying that you're, like, you're moving the, uh, the complexity from I need to structure this object this way and whatnot. I'm like, I'm going to need to have this list, have this set that has these keys and so on, right? Well, there's two things in the The first one is you know the, the whole process of going from, say, a CSV to an HTML. Well, you need to figure out how to transform, and, <coughs> and that figuring out cost is going to be sort of the same if you're dealing with an object-oriented language than a functional language. I would actually say that that's something that's much better done on a list like, because if there's data transforms exactly yeah. if yeah. there's something that are great at is just taking data and altering it through successive steps until it looks like whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So no, it's not really there. In fact, since you can very quickly throw things together, like you just add a new key to a map if you want, before you even qualify this as a record, I don't think that you need to have a lot of planning as your for for this particular case. Right. You, know, you would just experiment with the transformation right. and you would see if you get what you get on the other end. It does well it does transfer the cost, and this is not again different from the object you're trying to decide. Where the cost would be on this is on you understanding what a map function does, what reduce does, you know, um, understanding the verbs that reduce uses. 
but this is a one-time cost. Yeah. Once you have learned those graphs for this particular transformation, you use them for any other transformation that you get. But again, that's the cost of learning the language itself. Right? Yes. Yeah. That's not a. It's, it's not a recovery not project. Something. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas if you're, if you have to start a new project and you start to think, uh, okay, I'm gonna have, this is gonna be an abstract class and these things are gonna inherit it and then I'm gonna have an abstract factory factory. This is a cost that you do pay per project. So it's, it's the same thing with like, oh, this is going to need a getter, this is going to need a setter, this is going to need a property, like this particular object, right? Mm -hmm. like I, I would have to, I would have that same mental process when I'm figuring out whether something in my, in my list is going to need one key or another, right? But I, I guess the, the difference would be that at that point I would be in the middle of my transform figuring out, oh, I'm going to need this as well, and this as well, and exactly. resulting. Okay. You figure, oh, at this point I have these keys and I'm missing this one, then I need to apply an extra step that calculates that key mm -hmm. But it's very much as you go. Yeah. Anyone? Did you ever miss static typing in closure? Miss, miss, no. There's cases where you can see its use. But as I'm sure you were here, I was mentioning that you can add type annotations to closure if you want. Uh, well, there's two things. There's core.type, which, which is a library that enforces types all true. But you can just say, this, this thing has three parameters, and I always want the first one to be an UUID, for instance. And it will bar 50% anything else than a UUID. That, that, that's a runtime check, right? It's a runtime check, yes. But uh, it saves you from having that thing yeah. in and down at some point. Easy. Can you have that be a, a, a hint to the compiler and tell it to like, oh, this is going to be X, Y, Z class? Does that work? Uh, well, it would work. I'm not sure, again, if it gets really... I'm not sure if it could consistently evaluate that compile time, since you could be calling this function from whatever. Remember that I could just load this on the REPL and then... I, I was talking in terms of like having the bytecode get generated, the JVM bytecode get, gen get generated, so that that gets enforced. I have not really seen how it's doing it, so can I can't say. So, but so I think he's asking if there is a lint or a hint or something like that. There are some linters for closure, but we haven't tested as much. And um, what you do get is mostly as and this was this was expecting a collection, this is not a collection kind of things. So, but again, a lot of these happen at runtime. At uh, at compile time is not as trivial because I have language. Again, you could be calling it from anywhere. How often do you find yourself defining new macros? Actually, not as often as I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few things that I've found that... Uh, the thing is, there's nothing really that you can... Okay, that's not entirely true. Let me put it this way. There's very few situations where you could do something with a macro that you wouldn't do with a function. The macro has the advantage that you're saving calls and well, a whole bunch of others. But since I really haven't written that many macros, it's the sort of thing that I need to get back to and figure out if it's the best case scenario or not. By and large, if you look at this topology code, I think that, well, there must be two or three macros in there and the rest are pure functions. Anything else? Why was, why, what, uh, why was, I was asking earlier about uh, Haskell was that one thing I don't like about Haskell is that uh, you get the full static typing with no type annotations most of the time. Because, uh, but of course, in, mainly in uh, Haskell programs, you specify types in order to serve as type signatures, but it uh, uh, Haskell program doesn't need any type annotation, it figures it out uh, all the types in the program. Right. So what you're saying is that it has, you have to do type annotation, but you will still get type inference, like you get them? Yeah, it, yeah. Yes, it infers everything. Oh. Okay. It, uh, for example, C-sharp can infer a few things, Java can also infer very few things, but in Haskell, the type inference really works all the way down. Oh, cool. Now, what's the, let's say, the library situation in Haskell? You're still tied to it some thing. You know, we don't have like a Haskell for .NET. Well, I guess we have F-sharp, which is sort of... Uh, on the website, from what I saw, I'm not really experienced with Haskell, but uh, 
What I saw is that uh, ESO2 seems like a pretty good framework for uh, web development. Okay. And uh, on the website, uh, it seems to be pretty mature. I saw there are also a lot of libraries for, for writing compilers and stuff like this. I think compilers is one of the area where, where uh, uh, Haskell uh, really shines. Mm. Cool. Uh, like I said, I really don't have enough familiarity with unfortunately. There's only so much mental bandwidth and only so much time. And I do think I would have a harder time sending a client from Haskell than in well, even Haskell has a hard time uh, with types when it comes to something like transducers. In order to, to encode transducers in Haskell, you need the uh, non standard extensions, and you're actually forced to write them sometimes. Those are, aren't going to be inferred. So, if you go to more advanced concepts like transducers, uh, it's, get, it's getting complicated. So, maybe at some point, uh, dynamic typing is more useful. Yeah, one of the cases that I found actually, I tried to do some F sharp work, which in F sharp has type entrance, even to with some, like the type providers in F sharp are really interesting. Who's familiar with the type providers in F sharp? Yeah. Okay, well, screen short version of it, you can tell it, hey, this is a bit of XML, like make a type for it. And it makes you a type that conforms to that sort of signature. And particularly useful if you're calling, let's say, a REST API that returns, returns a whole bunch of XML code for you. When I ran into issues is that on F sharp, this is really all fine and dandy when you're working with very nicely behaved code. But the moment that you have to try, that you have to talk to an API, where whomever wrote it, like sometimes it returns this structure, and sometimes it returns this other structure, and sometimes it returns something completely different. Like F sharp ends up with this monstrous, or ended up at least the time, with this monstrous type provider that tries to be the three things and just has a maybe I'm this, or maybe I'm that, or maybe I'm the other thing. That's an area where dynamic languages just have the edge. I mean, you just, oh, I can take that. Fine, perfect. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs>